Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to some more Warhammer lore. Normally, we would be covering the Horus Heresy today, but since I've been doing that pretty much the entirety of the month, I figured we might do something else this day, and we'll continue on with the Horus Heresy next month. But fear not, for today we do have a beautiful topic. The Chaos Dwarves Bull Centaurs. Oh me, oh my, I tell you, whilst the Skaven are still the bestest, fluffiest creatures in the entire Warhammer universe, the Chaos Dwarves are a damn close second. And speaking of favourites, it is time to also do just a little bit of one of my favourite activities, shilling. Because I do have a new shirt available on the Teespring store, in this case, excited gas mask noises. Because if the siege taught us anything, it is that everything is relative. A theme that fits in quite well with today's topic, because some may be of the view that the Chaos Dwarves are corrupted, inferior, bastardized versions of the proud dwarves of the World's Edge Mountains, but those are of course poor, misguided individuals, for in reality, the Dowies are, the Chaos Dwarves, are a clear example of evolution. For what, after all, are the primary drawbacks of the Dwarven physiology, if not short, stunty legs and a very modest top speed? Both problems neatly solved by taking the good half of the Dwarf, the strong upper body and the handsome facial features, and planting the body of a bull beneath it. And voila, you have bull centaurs. I absolutely love these old models. The Chaos Dwarves was the very first army book I ever bought, and in that army book I remember there was a battle report between the High Elves and the Chaos Dwarves, and I must have read that battle report a hundred times. And were it not for Games Workshop mystifistical decision to sweep the Chaos Dwarves so far under the rug that they were barely mentioned ever again, they would probably have been my favourite Warhammer army. And whilst the Chaos Dwarves have been seeing a little bit of a resurgent in recent memory, Ah, I don't know, I don't know. The new Chaos Dwarf models, the miniatures, the bull centaurs as well, they're cool, but are they truly as good as the Chaos Dwarves of old? I still have my doubts. But enough fond memories, let us move on to the subject of today's video. The bull centaurs. Sacred warriors of the Dawizar and favoured sons of Hushut. The Bull Centaurs fulfil a very special role in Chaos Dwarf society. The Dawi Zar, literally meaning the Dwarves of Fire, are a highly religious group. Their nation ruled over by high priests, also given the title of Sorcerers. Each one of these powerful individuals, of which there are but a few hundred in the entire Chaos Dwarf nation, all rule over their own private kingdoms in the name of Hushut. And the Bull Centaurs are their most trusted, loyal and favoured servants, granted rights and privileges beyond all other Chaos Dwarves, save of course the Sorcerers themselves. This special treatment stems not merely from the obvious advantages of befriending such physically imposing creatures as the bull centaurs, but also from their religious significance. They are considered to be the favoured sons of Hashut, Hashut of course being a bull-headed god, and with the bull centaurs lower halves being those of bulls, the connection is hardly difficult to spot. It is also said that the very first few bull centaurs were chosen directly by Hashut himself, when the god, whom the Dawizar call the Father of Darkness, rescued the group of dwarves that would eventually become the Dawizar as they were at the very edge of their endurance, lost on the Great Plains. And whilst one should always take stories about the direct intervention of gods with a grain of salt, 
It is true that the bull centaurs are a stable mutation found only amongst the Dawis are, and while still relatively rare, their numbers are far too considerable to be considered mere fluke accidents of nature. They are also remarkably well-formed mutants, retaining all of the strength, endurance, and intellect of their bipedal brethren, with seemingly no drawbacks whatsoever, as if they were intelligently designed. At the very least, the sorcerers of the Daoizar seem to think so, although there is still room for improvement. When a bull centaur is born, almost always resulting in the death of the mother, seen as a valuable sacrifice, of course, the child is then handed over as tribute to the sorcerers. The sorcerer who receives the child then raises it in accordance to ancient tradition, training them for war, for discipline, and for order, and, of course, most importantly of all, ensuring that they are as loyal to the sorcerers as they are to Hashut. As a part in this training, their bodies are also subtly and slowly changed and modified. Ancient secrets that are a mix of both sorcery and technology is used to harden the bull centaur skin until it becomes something best described as living metal. Indeed, the change is so drastic that should a bull centaur be wounded, an unlikely but possible scenario, then the only way to close the wound would be further application of the tinctures used to harden the bull centaur skin in the first place, as well as, well, flat out metalworking tools, rivets, hammers, nails, clamps, and considerable heat. It almost sounds as if the medical procedure to fix the injury might end up being more painful than the injury itself. But that is all merely a part of a day's work for a bull centaur. And speaking of work, what exactly do the bull centaurs do? Well, let us start with the most obvious usage for a bull centaur, that which has to do with the battlefield. When the Dawi Zar go to war, they do so in a fashion that is at once reminiscent of how their mountain-dwelling cousins go to war, and also in ways completely and utterly different, and almost unique indeed, to the Dawi Zar. Similar to their less chaotic cousins, the backbone of the Chaos Dwarf armies is made up of slow, but tough, heavily armoured infantry, supported by a powerful gun line, utilising the experimental black powder technology of the Chaos Dwarves, both to lob mighty missiles at the enemy and unleash devastating volleys of blunderbuss fire, meant to shred any enemy foolish enough to get close. The Dawi Zar's artillery park is one of the most destructive in the old world, and also one of the most unconventional. Only the Skaven can lay claim to an even more quirky and eccentric ensemble of heavy weaponry. But where the Dawi Zar really start diverging from their underground family is in what they surround that solid core with. In the case of the Dwarves, that solid core of heavy infantry is supported by an even heavier core of super heavy infantry, wearing Ancestor Forge Grumril armor nearly impenetrable to all but the most magically or masterfully forged of enemy weaponry, or alternatively that propelled at a high enough speed from, say, a cannon. And whilst the Dwarven army does include the occasional lighter element, they are light only by Dwarven standards. Even the Rangers would probably be considered at least medium infantry by practically any other race. And the closest things the Dwarves ever get to light cavalry, or indeed cavalry at all, are either gyrocopters or a Dwarf Lord carried aloft on a shield by two other Dwarven warriors. <laughs> As I said, 
everything is relative. But the Dawizar have a bit more of a conventional view on warfare, whilst they too are burdened with the same physiology that makes them excellent heavy infantry, but makes them considerably less than excellent skirmishers or light cavalrymen, they have a simple and elegant solution to this problem. Slavery. The Dark Father placed all these other races on the Earth for a reason, after all. And what other reason could there possibly be for all of these inferior beings' existence other than to serve the Dawizar? And several of these races can be used in warfare. Naturally, some are more cooperative than others. They have their uses. The orcs, for example, are good if disobedient labourers. Goblins can also be utilised for their dexterous little thieving fingers, although close supervision is required. Humans are a bit more middle of the road, not particularly skilled at any one task, but relatively obedient. For warfare, however, there is one subject race that is far more valued than any other, the Hobgoblins. Technically speaking, the Hobgoblins are a variant upon the more commonly found Goblin, although these days they have evolved into pretty much their own species, partially due to their different physiology and partially due to... <laughs> certain choices in their past. We shan't go too deeply into that here, we'll save that for a proper Hobgoblin video which will be produced sometimes between now and the return of Jesus Christ, but suffice to say, their choices have left them with very, very few friends in the Warhammer world, even including other greenskins. A race famous for infighting, continuous betrayal, treachery and backstabbing, has universally decided that hobgoblins are simply just too treacherous to be allowed back into their good graces. Just let that sink in for a moment there. Hobgoblins are so untrustworthy that even other goblins have said that enough is enough. That's like a politician refusing to work with another politician because he lies too much. We are well and truly off the scales with this one, boys and girls. Well and truly. To the point that now, the Hobgoblin's only hope of protection and patronage is either joining one of the massive Hobgoblin hordes that roam the Eastern Plains, a harsh lifestyle in its own regards, not to mention a rather treacherous one since hobgoblins over there are hardly any more cooperative than the ones in the Darklands, or join in with the Dawizar. And by join in, I mean enter into slavery. Or, well, actually, allow me to rephrase that. What the Dawizar put the hobgoblins in is not slavery. Far too crude and aggressive a word. Indentured servitude permanent indentured servitude is much more fitting, in that it is nicer sounding than outright slavery, and they do have a few rights, mostly pertaining to how they manage the rest of the slave population, but still, it is better than being a slave. If only marginally, and one of the perks of their preferred status is that they get to join the army. Yes, that is a perk. Trust me, after working in the Dawizar forges for long enough, you will consider the battlefield a nice, gentle vacation out in the fresh air. And once joined with the army, they provide much of what the Chaos Dwarves are lacking. Archers, skirmishers, light cavalry wolf riders, expendable chaff infantry, check, check, check and check. The presence of the Hobgoblins already have considerably increased the flexibility of the Chaos Dwarves' armies. In addition to this, they also bring far more magic than any self-respecting dwarf would ever consider. Since they are ruled over by sorcerers, they have a fair bit of magical bang for their bucks, in addition to a few monsters which we will get to in a moment. But of course, 
What about the bull centaurs? That being the original point that led up to this little side ramble of mine. In the field, the bull centaurs serve both as bodyguards of esteemed Chaos Dwarf personnel and exceptionally flexible shock cavalry. The shock part of the equation is of course rather easy to identify, namely the whole lower body of a bull thing. That is a lot of beef to send a hurling into the enemy's ranks. And the flexible part comes in the fact that this is not merely a mount. This is not merely a bullish monstrosity. A bull centaur is just as intelligent as any other Chaos Dwarf and has been trained ever since entering the service of their Sorcerer Masters to not only use their bulk and speed to their advantage, but also a wide assortment of close combat weaponry. A bull centaur need not only rely on its metallic hide to protect it from harm, it is more than capable of parrying, as well as placing a nice big round shield in between itself and the enemy's weapons. And of course, the Bull Centaur's intelligence is made clear on the battlefield in many other ways. Whereas a warhorse might be hesitant about having to charge down a wooden barricade, or be reticent to enter into an area of uneven footing, or heavy shrubbery where it might get stuck and not find an exit, or hell, the beast could simply just be scared by the noises of battle. None of these things are a concern for Bull Centaurs. For when man and mount is one, they never need fear that their mounts might rebel against them or become scared of some perceived impediment. Take urban warfare for example. It'd be quite the trick to get a horse to enter into a house and then maintain easy control of that horse whilst inside the house, but again for a bull centaur, there is no problem. As long as he can physically fit within the house, entering and manoeuvring around the cramped quarters, whilst perhaps not ideal, would present no more a challenge to him than it would a Chaos Dwarf of equal stature. This flexibility, intellect, combined with the bronze and speed, is also the primary reason why the Chaos Dwarves are so damn good at Blood Bowl, but that is neither here nor there. But what other roles do the Bull Centaurs fulfil? The battlefield one is relatively obvious, heavy shock cavalry with a bit of additional flexibility due to their intellect and self-control. But I did say that they had an important part within Dawizar society, not just on the battlefield. As you may probably already have guessed, this involves the sorcerers with the bull centaurs being their most loyal subjects. Now loyalty is not as big of a problem within Dawi's art society as it is within many quote unquote evil societies in the Warhammer world. The dwarves of fire have an honor code. They will not easily betray one another because as far as they are concerned it is them against the world. That kind of a mindset does bring a certain degree of solidarity. Nevertheless, as with all races, there certainly is some competition even amongst the Dawizar. Whilst the High Priests do not technically have any form of officially organised ranking or order structure amongst themselves, that does not mean that there are not those who are first amongst equals. Those with more power, more land, with a better positioning within society, those who possess the most productive forges, the largest numbers of slaves, or have led the most successful raids against the weaker species. And so whilst Chaos Dwarf society is remarkably free of open intrigue, especially compared to most other societies in the old world, there is still certainly an element of underhanded play. Hobgoblins, amongst other things, make excellent assassins, just <laughs> by the by, apropos of nothing. And the bull centaurs are the exact opposite of that. They are the defenders, whereas the assassins are the silent blades. They are the bodyguards, and perfect bodyguards as well. Strong, fast, intelligent, and unwaveringly loyal, for as far as they are concerned, their sorcerer masters speak directly on behalf of their Dark Father. 
and there is no force in the universe that they are more loyal to. Bull centaurs spend their entire lives guarding their masters, carrying out their business, their missions, and, perhaps their most vital duty of all, guarding the temples of Hushut, in particular his primary temple high atop the tower of Tsar Nagrund. And speaking of missions as well, whilst it may seem obvious that the bull centaurs trust their masters implicitly, what is perhaps a little bit more rare and surprising is that the sorcerers also have complete faith in the bull centaurs. The bull centaurs are their most favoured servants, their most loyal, their most trusted, not merely as a generalisation, but as a literal fact. A bull centaur would no more betray its master than it would betray Hushut himself and so they are frequently sent on the most secretive and complex of missions, those that require a great deal of… delicacy even. One might not think that a giant, bloodthirsty monster with the lower half of a bull could be particularly delicate, but you would be mistaken. When I say again and again that they are as intelligent as any Chaos Dwarf, it is to make sure you understand, these are not monsters. These are not brutes, these are dwarves. One of the most industrious and intelligent races in the old world, but bigger, faster, stronger, and completely without scruples, remorse, or some would even say empathy. You might even be starting to think that these seem like perfect monsters. An unnerving blend of high intellect with brutish strength and a complete savage abandonment of virtually all morals, but that is just because you have not yet seen what they might turn into. Now we are going to enter into a bit of theoretical country, a bit speculative, for to the best of my knowledge, there are no definitive sources stating that this is true, but amongst the Chaos Dwarves it is a commonly held belief that if a bull centaur receives even more of the Dark Father's favour, they will evolve into a new and frightening form, which the Davi Zar refer to as a Great Taurus. A massive flying bull the size of a town cart that channels butt hurt to such an extent that sparks quite literally flies from his hide. This thing is discontent and rage made manifest. A being of such overwhelming vexation that it makes Anakin Skywalker from the last of those three movies that now, in retrospect, that we know about the latest ones actually don't look as bad, look like nothing more than a mild mannered mango. Their hate boners are of such ferocious potency that the only place the Dawi Zar can keep them are in a gargantuan underground stable, quite literally ventilated by the white hot rage of tortured souls. And no, really, I'm not kidding here, they literally burn people to death over magical braziers so that the living space of these things can be kept at a balmy 1000 Celsius. <laughs> I just adore how these things fluff is written. It's the perfect example of that old style of fluff when Warhammer was a lot less serious, but wasn't quite as unserious as it once was, just on that, that perfect tipping point. I fondly imagine that the idea and the fluff for the Great Taurus was created as one of DW's law lackeys was having a nice comfortable urination session in a rival's cubicle, and then somewhat distracted by the pressing need to dream up a monster suitably horrific to fit into the army book of a bunch of snaggletoothed sorcerer sadists, that yet another law lad had dreamed up after a particularly adventurous foray into his medicine cabinet forgot to pull his winky in all the way before pulling up his zipper. I mean. You give me a better explanation for why someone would dream up something so maliciously disgusting as a burning great bull that Chaos Dwarves are expected to ride. This thing is so hot that steel swords that go near it start to melt, and somebody is expected to ride this thing. 
the sheer testicular trauma on display in merely expressing the idea would be enough to make any sane man cringe and stop writing immediately, unless he had recently experienced an equally if not even more horrifying fate and wanted to take it out on somebody else. But I suspect I have somewhat strayed from the original point of this video. The Great Taurus is, as you have probably gathered at this point, a very large flaming bull that may or may not be some form of evolved version of a bull centaur, Kind of like Pokemon, just with more burning corpses. And this evolution theory is primarily held up by the Chaos Dwarves themselves, whilst many other practitioners of magic are a bit more sceptical. They refer to the fact that the Great Taurus is clearly a demonic entity, and can only exist in areas suffused with the winds of magic, in this case particularly the wind of fire, a sheik. And whilst one could potentially be lured out of the Darklands with a great and powerful enough ritual of a sheik, such a thing would be very difficult and exceptionally dangerous, since even if a great Taurus were to be lured from the Darklands, well, making sure that it doesn't kill you might be even more difficult than creating the ritual. And make no mistake, this is not merely a flying bull. It's a hell of a lot more dangerous than that. It breathes fire, amongst one of many other things. Its hide is near impervious to mortal weaponry, if said weaponry could even reach the damn thing, as most weapons will run molten and blunt just by being near it. And <laughs> Sigmar help you if you were happening to wear metal armor at the time. For a rough power comparison, a regular Taurus would almost certainly be more than a match for a griffin or a hippogriff, but the largest and most ferocious examples of the species can be considerably more dangerous, possibly even on pair with a small dragon. And they have the temperament to match, although not the intelligence. If the Greater Taurus is truly an evolution from the Bull Centaur, then it seems to have shed almost all of its intelligence, instead of becoming a avatar of Hashut, the bull-headed god, abandoning all reason in a quest to grow ever closer to the Dark Father in his most vitriolic form. This of course means that riding one into battle is a little bit on the complicated side, the red-hot skin irradiating the heat of a furnace is one problem, the temperament another. If the Great Taurus simply decides that it wishes to see what kind of a squishing sound your head makes when it steps on it, there is precious little most Chaos Dwarves could do about it. This is why only the most powerful of lords and sorcerers could ever ride a Great Taurus both because they need a great deal of special rituals and protective wards to keep themselves unburnt, and an even greater amount of powerful wards to ensure that the Taurus does not get too inquisitive as to what they taste like. However, if these drawbacks can be overcome, then the Great Taurus will make for a mighty mount indeed, providing considerable brawn and mobility to the Sorcerer Lord riding it. There is, though, one other beast that is amongst many sorcerers considered to be an even finer mount than a Great Taurus, Whilst the bellicose nature of a Taurus fits the temperament of many Chaos Dwarven Lords just perfectly, the discerning sorcerer may instead seek out a Lamassu. These exceptionally rare creatures are thought to be yet another evolution, or perhaps mutation, of the Great Taurus. At least, they are thought of this way by the Chaos Dwarves. Others might suggest that the Lamassu is merely a form of manticore, or a monstrosity spawned from magic rather than mutation. But the Dawizar would point towards its face, so strangely reminiscent of their own, even down to the tusks and the great beards, and say that this could not be a coincidence. This is merely another aspect of the Dark Father's favour. 
And if, indeed, that is true, then the Lama Su is yet another aspect of Hashut. The bull-headed god may be shown in his most bellicose form in the Great Taurus, but in the Lama Su he shows a far more insidious appearance. For they are not mere beasts. They, much like the bull centaurs, they could possibly be some form of evolution of, are frighteningly intelligent. To the point that some skeptics amongst the Taoizar may have on occasion questioned whether or not it is the sorcerers who control the Lama Su, or the other way around. The truth of the matter probably lies somewhere in the middle. For whilst the Lama Su is an exceptionally intelligent creature and possessed of a strange form of magical charisma that allows it to convince many other lesser creatures like Vyavans, Pegasuses, or Griffins to do its bidding, the sorcerers of the Dawei Zar are no slouchers in that department either. And in all due likelihood, the one is manipulating the other only as much as the other is manipulating it. And both sides have something to offer the other. The Lamasu are not cowardly creatures, that is not the correct word, but cautious. They would much rather prefer to not have to do the fighting and the hunting themselves. They could, after all, get injured, or worse, killed. For whilst, of course, the Lama Zoo would never do something so silly as to underestimate an opponent or overestimate its own power, it is also intelligent enough to know that not everything can be predicted, and so it is better to be safe than sorry. And a Chaos Dwarf Sorcerer, commanding legions of slaves and armies of the Dao Izar, well, that would be a wonderful puppet indeed, and one that offers both food and lodging. Hmm. Quite the valuable alternative to roaming the Great Wastes alone. And as for the Sorcerer, the Lamazu offers both a versatile and powerful mount, and also secrets. The Lamasu may possibly be an offshot of the Great Taurus, maybe even long distant kin to the Chaos Dwarves themselves, but they are also now undisputably creatures of magic. And just like a human is an expert at breathing, because we do it all the time out of necessity, a Lamasu lives of magic. It is an expert in forming it, directing it, guiding it, and letting it suffuse its whole body to keep it alive. It is even able to use that magic to weave intuitive spells of protection, both able to neutralize enemy magic and fouling the swings of enemy soldiers. They might find their limbs or weaponry enwrapped in dark tentacle bindings, making it far more difficult for them to strike the Lama Zhu or its master, should it feel generous. Riding a Lama Su into battle is certainly a precarious partnership, but one that may just be worth the risk, and on the bright side, there are no chances of a Lama Su burning your testicles off, at least not unintentionally. And on that high note, I'll wrap up this video about bull centaurs, and also partially about the Great Taurus and the Lama Su as well. I figured I'd throw them in, because I really do like the theory that these are mutations and evolutions. As they grow further in the Dark Father's favour, they change and grow into different shapes, different aspects of Hashut. It would make a certain degree of sense, I mean, Chaos Champions most certainly do change their appearance quite drastically, and devolving into mindless, semi-mindless creatures at least, is also not unheard of. There is also a theory I shall mention here for order's sake. 
namely that whilst indeed the Taurus and the Lamassu do stem from the bull centaurs, it is not in a direct way, rather it is another form of mutation from the bull centaurs. When the Dark Father first gave his gifts to the Dawizar, he chose some for extra extra favour and extra 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 favour and turned them into Taurus and Lamassu. Personally, I actually do prefer the mutation evolution theory rather than this one because it sounds a little bit too, oh you get to be a bull centaur and you get to be a llama series and it's a bit random. But then again, there are also those heretics that suggest that Hashut is nothing more than an aspect of Zinch. Complete and utter lunacy of course, but, but, but possibilities. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.